Okay, good morning, folks. Rob White here at Dahlstrom Roll Form, and I'm here today to start a four-part series on the anatomy of a roll forming line. And we're gonna start today with the uh, first step in the process, which is the coil and the uncoiler. So we have a coil here, preload, ready to be loaded onto the uncoiler. And we're always using a chain hoist with a little gantry system here. The chains are uh, always inspected on a periodic basis. And we have a, a coil that has a specification for this product. Coil specs generally are um, ID, the inner diameter, which matches up with the uncoiler, and then OD, the outer diameter, which normally we would like to have as large as possible because the, the larger the diameter of the coil within the um, confines of the uncoiler's uh, capacity, the better it is for roll forming because it's less coil changes, which means less downtime. Uh, this happens to be a pre-painted textured coil today. Th these coils are specified by a term called PIW. PIW is pounds per inch of width. And so here we are ready to, ready to load up. It looks like we're about down to the end of this coil. You can see that the coil is retained on there by a center spindle that, that collapses. When the coil goes on, it expands and it locks the coil in place. This is a, a powered uncoiler. There are also other types of uncoilers. There are unpowered uncoilers that are driven by the pull of the downstream roll forming process. Normally that would be used for uh, non-pre-punched parts. Uh, when we're pre-punching, as we are in this line, we use a powered uncoiler. Uh, there also are double spindle uncoilers. Coil on one side, coil on the other, run this one out, spin around, and then connect this one a little bit quicker coil change. We have some of those here in our plant. Uh, there are coil cradles, which uh, kind of looks like a, a baby stroller where you put the whole coil in and it's just retained by the side walls and, and, and a roller system underneath. Primarily used for heavy gauge. Uh, the edge, edges can be disturbed on lighter gauge in those cradles. We have a couple of cradles here for heavier things as well. So the way this is controlled is by a loop control system. So what we have here is a laser that is connected to the control system and it knows when the coil strip is on the ground. When the downstream process pulls on that coil and it becomes taut, the laser knows that it, it, it gets closer in proximity and it will feed more material just to make sure that, that uh, there's enough slack in this first step before the pre-punching uh, to make sure that the downstream processes can go uninterrupted. That's the first step in the process. Part one, uncoiler and coil specs. Next will be uh, step two in the process, the straightening and leveling of the strip and the pre-punching. Part two is the pre-punching process. And the, I de define the pre-punching process as two separate things happening here. Uh, the first is we're taking the strip of, of steel from the coil and we're, and we're sending it through a coil straightener. Now what, when coils of steel are created, they have a certain amount of defect uh, cat categorized as three different types of defect. There's bow. Bow is created by the sheer fact that the steel is in a coil. The bow at the beginning of the coil is less because the diameter is larger. As it gets closer to the center, the, the bow becomes more because of that natural curvature of that coil. There's also camber. Camber is created sometimes in the slitting process and it tends to have the strip go left or right when it's coiled. The third potential defect is twist. You can, you can imagine twist like a ribbon. If you had a ribbon and you were twisting it, that could happen to the coil. The straightening process uses a series of rollers inside this unit to gradually massage the stresses both horizontally and, and, and uh, transversely from that strip before it enters the process. 
and it just takes it, it takes a few more variables out of you know what we have to do to come up with a quality part. So you can see here, this is a straightener. You, the coils are inside. We can change the amount of, of, of coil pressure we put on with those rollers to end up with a uh, a nice flat sheet going into the into the pre-punching process. So let's move to the pre-punching process next. Part two of the uh, pre-punching process is, of course, a press that puts features into the flat stock. After it's been uncoiled and straightened, it comes into this process. And what's happening here is we have a control system that watches every component in the line and makes sure that all the speeds are maximized and that all the triggering happening for each step is controlled. We use AMS controls on our line. They're the premier control provider for roll forming in the US. And what we have here is a feeder. Now what this does is there's two pinch rolls that come together on the strip and they very accurately position that strip underneath the die so that the pattern that is eventually needed for the final part is very precise. And we're talking about positioning here within five thousandths of an inch. And the rollers can be different materials. They can be steel, they can be, they can be knurled, they can be rubber, um, depending on the material and how we have to uh, treat the surface dimensions. But what's happening is once the material is positioned, the press stroke makes a hit and the material stops for that moment. That's why we need the slack loop in the beginning and we're gonna have a slack loop after the, after the punching as well. The die is pneumatically controlled with features. So if in this die, we've got a die that's about 30 inches wide by about four feet long. And there are different features in that die that we turn on and off with this control system so that the patterns can be flexible. We will move the strip and we'll hit two or three punches. We'll move the strip again, we'll turn those off. We might hit two or three other ones. And that, that combination of patterns is what creates the flexibility in the, uh, the pre-punch. So you can see, very accurately punched, heading to the next uh, process, which is the actual roll forming. And again, using a slack loop to control the material and, and trigger when a punching happens while the roll form mill is moving continuously. Now the next step is going to be the actual forming process, roll forming mill. Part three is going to be the actual forming, using the roll form mill to form the shape. Forming process, we've got a roll forming mill. Mills can be either uh, left to right or right to left, depending on where you want to put the mill in your, in your plant and where you want the operator to be. This happens to be a left to right mill. The back part of the mill is driven by electric motors and gearing. That's what creates the, the force on the material through the shafts. The front uh, stands on a roll former are removable, which allows us to put the tools on. Two of the most important specifications of a roll forming mill are the diameter of the shaft. This happens to be a two and a half inch diameter mill and the number of forming passes on the mill. This mill happens to have 24 forming passes. The more forming passes we have, the more complex of a shape we can do because we have to impart a certain amount of work per station to form that shape. If you can see here, there's a progression where the, the, the flat sheet gradually after pass after pass will, will make its way to the final shape. The distance between the lower shaft and the upper shaft is also important. It allows for larger, in this case, on this mill, it allows for larger diameter roll tools, which means we can form deeper shapes because as the shape gets deeper, the diameter of the rolls, both top and bottom, have to be larger to accommodate that, that profile. The horizontal distance between the forming passes is important too. If it's too close, you're not gonna get the uh, transition from pass to pass that you want for that particular shape. 
And if they're too far, you're gonna lose the pass-to-pass -pass capturing that you need for that shape. Again, this is the, the, the roll forming line. This is what really creates the, the, the bending value. Um, but because once the tools are created, it doesn't matter if there's two bends or 15 bends on there, the process is the same. That's where it starts to realize the benefit of roll forming is complex angles, radiuses, and the number of bends can be done in the same process it would take to just do two bends. We'll go ahead and turn on the mill and we'll step back. We've, we've, we've removed the guarding today and we've turned it off for safety purposes, but I'm gonna step back now and, and turn, have, have the operator turn the mill on so you can actually see the forming process. Just to describe a little bit more about the actual roll form tooling and how the machine is set up, I've got a little demonstration here. Uh, anybody who knows anything about roll forming knows that the setup process is the critical part of the whole process. Uh, it can take anywhere from four hours on a simple part to uh, eight to nine hours on a complex part. So what happens is we remove the, uh, the outboard stands and we expose the shafts. The shafts are the driven part of the forming process. There are roll tools on the bottom shaft and there are roll tools on the top shaft. And you can see here that the tools are keyed and, and of course the reason they're keyed is to be able to get that driving force from the uh, gear system behind. And so the, the roll tools themselves, you can see, are tool steel, they're all marked for the progression from uh, forming pass one to the final forming pass. And they're inserted onto the shaft in that way. It's very critical to make sure, obviously, that the correct passes are in the correct sequence. That's why the marking of the tools is so important and the staging of the tools when they're brought to the line in a simple way to um, make sure that they're on. Um, and once, uh, once the tools are on, there are spacers that are used to make sure that we take up the appropriate roll space. And then these outboard stands are replaced and we bring the top stand down and we get that mesh between the upper roll and the lower roll. And that gapping there is absolutely critical. Um, we use feeler gauges to make sure that it's within thousands of, of the material thickness. And that's what really controls the consistency and the repeatability of roll forming. So again, top, top shaft, bottom shaft, upper rolls, lower rolls, and a brief description of the setup process. And step four is the cutoff process. And I, I, maybe I should more accurately describe that as the cutoff and or secondary, secondary operations that happen before the part goes into uh, packaging. So we're here at our, the first line we started with, and, and, and this is the end of the forming process, the last forming pass. And what we have here is a linear encoder. A linear encoder is a wheel that is resting on the material and very accurately recording the speed of the material through the process. That information is sent to a servo-driven cutoff system. All of the cutoffs and controls that we have here, again, are, are AMS controls, closed loop, servo-driven uh, mechanics on these lines. Uh, so what's happening is we're reading the speed of the material and in the pre-punch process we talked about earlier, we're also punching a small sensing hole in the part. And if you can see over here, right before the cutoff, there is a, a very small sensor that's reading a hole in the part. It knows the speed of the material. It knows how long in time, based on that speed, that the part has to be cut off and their servo-driven screw moves the tool at the same speed and very accurately positions that cut. 
So again, you know, we have a control panel here at the, at the end of the line and a control panel at the front of the line. Each can control the, all of the components in the system to make sure that we get repeatable, accurate parts. So here we've got you know, a, a part coming through. We've got the speed. The hole is about to go underneath the sensor. The sensor picks up the hole. Timer, move the die, make the cut. That is a typical cutoff process for roll forming. Again, the process never stops. It is continuous. Uh, Jim here is, is, is doing some additional um, end bends on the, these parts. Again, pre-painted steel. We're doing some end flanges at the end because uh, roll forming, of course, only can do linear bending, cannot do end bending. So we have a, um, processes that we will roll into place and, and then perform these kinds of operations. So, and, th and then this does conclude the process. This is the, the, the packing crate that will be uh, buttoned up and, and shipped to the customer, um, all barcoded and, and um, you know, ready to be received. That's about all we have for the, uh, the series, the anatomy of a roll forming line. Um, thanks for listening. And, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at Dahlstrom Roll Form or any of our account management staff. Thank you again. We'll see you next time.